Good morning. Welcome to Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland and your host for Wake Up with Ashland. It's great to be with you. As always, we enjoy these opportunities to share stories and items from the collection that we don't always get to share. We appreciate being able to do that with you and that you tune in so regularly. So we're glad to see you and uh, glad to have the opportunity to share what I think is a very interesting and important story in advance of Veterans Day. I want to take a quick minute to thank my cameraman, Ken, he's back again, and we're continuing to evolve this process. Um, so hopefully this will continue to improve in quality and clarity, et cetera. If you have any questions or concerns about that, let me know. Um, and we appreciate the sponsor who provides us with Ken every week. Uh, today, I am going to talk about a subject that I knew little about when I arrived at Ashland, but that has become of great interest to me. Um, that subject is the three United States naval vessels named for the estate or for Henry Clay. And they are the USS Ashland LSD-1, the USS Henry Clay SSBN-625, and the USS Ashland LSD-48. So these three vessels bear Henry Clay's name. Uh, there is a long tradition of vessels named for Henry Clay. Clay was a supporter of maritime affairs in general. Uh, he was a supporter of government support to improve shipping and the ability to transport goods. Uh, prior to the War of 1812, he was a staunch proponent of U.S. government support for protecting American seamen from impressment by the British and continued over the years to express great support for American seamen. So in many ways, it is highly appropriate that he should have his name on a U.S. Navy vessel uh, and or be honored in that way. So I think it's, it's really great that he was. I'm going to start here with the USS Henry Clay SSBN 625. Uh, this vessel is a United States ballistic missile submarine. This vessel uh, came into service uh, February 20th, was commissioned on February the 20th, 1964, and it saw duty all over the world as part of the Cold War. Uh, this sub served until uh, November 5th, 1990. It was decommissioned uh, and it was part of the Cold War uh, and the escalation of nuclear tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. This vessel was nuclear powered. It had a nuclear reactor that provided the source of propulsion. Uh, it also carried a battery of either Trident or Polaris nuclear missiles. So this machine was a literal floating island of death. This could rain death from anywhere in the world that it could go uh, and had truly frightening destructive power. We're very fortunate that at no time was an order ever given uh, to launch the missiles on board this sub. Uh, we have a number of important artifacts in our collection relating to it. I want to start with this one because this is at the beginning. When a vessel is commissioned, it is traditional to break a bottle of alcohol, usually champagne or wine, across the hull. And this is what remains of the bottle broken in the commissioning uh, of the USS Henry Clay. And this was done by Mrs. Green Gibson. She was a great granddaughter of Henry Clay. Here's the ribbon that was on the bottle. You can see uh, it, is, it is embroidered with the name of the ship. Uh, Newport News is where it was commissioned. That's in Virginia. Uh, it was a major naval base there. It's always been a major naval base. This is the company that did so. So we have what's left of that. That was donated to us and it comes in this beautiful presentation box. I think this was given to uh, Miss Gibson and then she eventually gave it to the museum. Uh, I have some other material that comes from a couple of people who were assigned to this vessel, um, who donated some material to the collection. So we have some actual parts of the vessel. This is the largest part. That's the stern light. So the stern is the back end of the ship. This would have been right at the very end of the ship um, and would have been an indicator that the ship was passing at that end. And you can see it would have screwed on like so. And there, this, there would have been a bulb inside. Um, in fact, the bulb is still there. So we have some parts of the vessel. This is a, a thermostat, basically, from, uh, I think, from the nuclear control room. Um, and it would indicate temperature, uh, probably in the engine area. 
This is an interesting device. That's a light bulb. It's a red light bulb. This particular light bulb is made from extremely thick glass. So it's designed to survive in the event a depth charge is detonated near the vessel. A depth charge was a type of explosive that was designed to detonate at a particular depth. So you launch it from a boat or a plane or a helicopter, it drops into the water, and when it reaches a certain depth, it explodes. And the idea is that you set it to explode in proximity to a submarine to destroy it. So this is designed to su survive a shock wave from such a detonation. We have this sign. This is my, my favorite piece. This is from the missile compartment telling you this is an area for authorized personnel only. So don't go playing around in the missile compartment. Probably a good idea. Uh, if you come to Ashland, you come to the second floor, you'll see a set of stairs going up. Uh, and there's a sign on a rope across the way that says no access or whatever. Uh, that's, those are the stairs to my office. And I have long thought that I really ought to install this sign. It has a little more gravitas to it, um, having protected nuclear missiles, etc. So maybe someday I will do that. And we have a couple of wrenches that were used. Oh, you can see this one's engraved with the name of the ship in the division. 625 is its number. This one, um, I don't think is marked. Uh, but there are two kinds of wrenches that we use for work on the vessel. Um, so we have some tools. Now, work on a nuclear sub was difficult. The people who worked on the sub typically were on duty for several months, three months, or whatever at a time. And unlike surface vessels, they were underwater for pretty much that whole time because the goal of a submarine is stealth. You don't want your enemies to know where the sub is, and the best way to accomplish that is to keep it submerged, make it hard as, as hard as possible to find. So when a sub left port, it would typically go to depth, and it might stay there for all but a day or two of those three months, or perhaps even the whole time. So people who worked on subs had to get used to the idea of not seeing daylight or breathing fresh air, etc., for these long extended periods. Uh, and it could become rather discomforting being on a sub for the, that kind of time. I mean, some people didn't handle that very well. So that's a difficulty of that work. We have here uh, some uniform parts worn by a crewman on the sub. Uh, we have a hat and it's got the sub number on it. You'll notice this hat is gold. That's very important. That's not just uh, an attractive color. In this case, with subs, unlike surface vessels, they have two crews. A blue crew and a gold crew. Blue and gold are the colors of the United States Navy. And so they designate the crews as blue and gold. And for three months, one color, one team will be on. The sub will come into port. That crew will exit. The other crew will enter. And they will go on to patrol for several months. So it allows the sub to be constantly on patrol with very little time in port otherwise. So it allowed this submarine to be out and about and where it could do its job the majority of time. So it we could be in use in that way. Uh, this uniform was worn by one of the sailors. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily a daily work uniform. This is more uh, for more formal occasions. Not This isn't dress formal or anything, but uh, for example, shore leave, you might wear something like this. Uh, you can see it's got the name of the vessel on the shoulder. This is called a shoulder strap or a rocker strap. Um, you can see over here, this is how you know this is a submariner. This is the insignia of the submarine corps. You've got a sub in the middle, and these are called dolphins. If you come to Ashland, if you look at the downspouts at Ashland on the mansion, we have the exact same dolphins. And that's the insignia of the submarine service. And in the submarine service, it takes a series of trainings to become fully trained and fully able to operate the sub. When you become fully able to do that, you receive your dolphins, and that's a big deal. You become a full member of the crew um, with certain rights and privileges, but this is how you know this person served in the submarine corps and was fully authorized. They have their dolphins, so that's an important piece of insignia. And you can see on the shoulder, uh, this person was, I believe in, in the Navy, this would be a chief in the Army or the Marines, this would be a sergeant. Um, you'll see here the uh, nuclear insignia on the sleeve indicating this person served on a nuclear vessel. So this is uh, a uniform that was worn in the 60s uh, aboard this vessel. Um, 
if you're interested in knowing about this, you can get this book called Three Knots to Nowhere by Ted Dubay. Ted Dubay was a crewman on the USS Ashland. In fact, some of this stuff is Ted's. Uh, Ted wrote a really great account of the ship uh, that explores his time on it and what the ship did and how being on a sub works. Uh, it's a fascinating read. If you've never read anything about subs or don't know how subs operate, I highly recommend it. I think you can probably find it on Amazon. It's published by McFarland Books. Uh, really, really well done. Really, really a fascinating book. Um, well worth a look. And it gives you a real insight into the difficult life of submariners. And it may well make you realize you don't want to be on a sub because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, one other note I will make is that the USS Ashland, in the course of its service, over the years it served from uh, the early 60s until 1990, lost one crewman in that time. Uh, this was an accident. It's described in Ted's book. They had come to port in a place in Spain where they had a port they could go for uh, supplies or whatever, um, which they did very rarely. But this, in this case, they had gone to this port, supplied up, they left port, and were underway when it was noticed that a hatch was loose up in the conning tower. And this is the conning tower right there, this piece that sticks up. Um, and this, uh, there's a ladder that goes up, go on off the sub that way if you want. Um, so they notice this hatch is loose. Well, they dispatch a crewman to go and tighten the latch, hatch down. Well, he goes up to the conning tower, gets to the top of it, and while he's working to do that, they're in very rough seas and a huge wave comes along and he is knocked off the ship. Well, when that happens, they, they call a man overboard, they summon the uh, rescue party and attempt to locate him. And this attempt goes on for most of the day. Unfortunately, they can't find him. His, they, they are unable to locate him in the water. Uh, and eventually, after doing this for about a day, um, by virtue of the nature of their mission, they cannot linger on the surface any longer. They have no choice. They've got to go to depth and continue on their mission. So they abandoned their search and the man was never found. Uh, he is actually, uh, he was actually from Versailles and there is a cenotaph in Versailles in his honor because his body was never recovered. It's a terrible story and it's illustrative of the many difficulties of the subsurface as compared to the surface Navy. Now, the other two vessels that we have are the USS Ashland LSD-1, which you can see right here. This picture was created for a service person named uh, Herbert Rolfs. You can see these are ribbons that indicate various actions or, or uh, parts of his service, battles, service ribbons, etc. cetera. Uh, most military personnel wear this on their uniform over their breast and it allows a, someone in the know to look at it and see immediately where these person has served, what they've accomplished, what awards they've received, and so on. But this is the ship. This is, is an LSD, or landing ship dock. And because it is LSD-1, the USS Ashland was the first such ship ever uh, commissioned. And a landing ship dock, if you look at the picture, has at the back a well. This can be filled with water. And the purpose of the landing ship dock is to land man and material in an amphibious assault or to repair vessels used for that purpose in the well at the back. So it's a floating dry dock. It is also a way to put men on the beach. Uh, I think some of these vessels were involved at D-Day. Uh, the big vessel comes in, launches some of those small craft you see carrying men right up to the beach. Uh, so that's a way these were used. Now this particular vessel, and you can see it's World War II crew right here, uh, was primarily operated in the Pacific. So Inuak, Tinian, Iwo Jima, these are all places where it landed men as part of amphibious assault. So this was involved in actions throughout the South Pacific, throughout the islands, where the United States and Japan are going back and forth trying to protect or claim those islands uh, and fighting an ongoing war across the Pacific uh, during World War II. This document is a very interesting document. This is a plank owner document. Uh, this was issued to the crew 
there, there is a, a, an association that formed of members of the original LSD-1 crew. And when the second L uh, USS Ashland was commissioned, they received a plank owner plaque. Plank owner means member of the original crew. So if you are on the first crew of a new vessel, you get a plank owner plaque or, or certificate. So when that vessel is launched, all the members of the crew would receive one of these, indicating they were a member of the original crew, and are referred to as plank owner. This uniform is a World War II era uniform worn by a member of the crew of the Ashland, uh, a duty uniform, again, three stripes, chief. In this case, uh, uh, he was in signals, communication, elect uh, electrical, this would have probably been before electronics, so this would have been electrical communication, telegraph, and so on. Um, so this individual wore the uniform in the service during uh, World War II. So this is a very old uniform, and you can see relatively very similar to this. The uniform styles did not change much over that time, and I think they still wear uniforms relatively similar. Um, and these are wool. Now, over the years, we've kept up with the Ashlands uh, in... Uh, the early 90s, uh, they reintroduced the LSDs, and we're going to uh, uh, initiate a whole new line of them. And the original crew of the LSD-1 wanted to see the USS Ashland returned uh, to service. So they petitioned for the LSD-48 to be named USS Ashland. Here it is at its launch. And it was. This is a piece of one of these wooden timbers, a keel block um, that we have in our collection, you see in 1992, it was commissioned and went into service. And it remains in service, and it has been in service in a variety of capacities. Uh, it supports the war on terror, um, so it has done that in a number of capacities. Uh, was damaged in port uh, in an attack in the early 2000s. Uh, it, Provides a variety of duties. About uh, 10 years ago, I guess, or so, uh, the USS Ashland was on patrol in the Pacific and got a call about two ladies who were on a vessel sailing across the Pacific, uh, and their vessel had run into difficulty, engine failure, so they went and rescued these two ladies who'd been adrift for some time, which is one of those things. They happened to be in the right place at the right time, um, so they were able to, to uh, affect that activity. Now, we continue to maintain contact with this crew. Uh, we periodically receive visits from members of the crew of the LSD-48, and we have a number of items they have uh, presented us. Here's a plaque. This one uh, doesn't give the date, but this is one of the plaques. Uh, when they come to visit, uh, we always enjoy having them. We give them tours. Uh, we want them to know about the namesake of their vessel and feel a connection to this place. Uh, this came, uh, it was given to us by the commanding officer, that's the second in command, uh, below the captain of the vessel, you can see there the vessel, uh, and this certificate, um, one of their visits, he was involved in Operation Enduring Freedom, January to August 2010. Um, another thing they've brought this is mine. Uh, they gave this to me. This is called a challenge coin, and these are given out you know, as thank yous or tokens of appreciation, etc. And you can see it's got the ship on one side, and the ship's, this is the ship's logo on the other. And we have another plaque. This one is from a 2012 visit. They visit every four or five years. Crews change, and so, you know, every so often, enough of the crew has changed that or they get a new captain and then they decide to make a visit if they happen to be out and about or whatever. Um, so we're always appreciative of this. This is always a, uh, an important time for us. We always look forward to it. And one of the things that we do uh, is we take them and do a photo down by uh, the bell of the United States Ashland, USS Ashland LSD-1. Um, that bell was presented to us uh, that bell was used on the ship when the ship was decommissioned. It was taken off and was at a ROTC facility in, I want to say, Mississippi, somewhere in the south. And eventually they decided they wanted it to come here. So they had the Navy transfer it. It was brought here and it's mounted down by the cottage. 
And any given day at Ashland, if you're here for a while, you'll probably hear someone come up and ring it. Um, so that's a popular sound here, and it's always a reminder to us of the people who served on that ship and continue to serve today on the LSD-48 and who have served on even the Henry Clay. Uh, these people sacrificed, these people uh, suffered uh, so that we may enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. We are deeply appreciative of the service they have given and remember them every year, all year, but most especially around Veterans Day. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed this and please remember anyone who has served at this time, um, our freedom isn't free and it's important we recognize that. The Clay family had a long tradition of service and we recognize all of those in the family who have served this country across the years. All right, so I uh, hope you've enjoyed that look at the USS Ashland and the USS Henry Clay. So it, uh, it's a neat story. It's one that we're proud to be associated with and proud to be able to share. Um, we appreciate that we have a number of items from a number of sources, including the USS Ashland Association and a couple of the crew that hit the play. So that's uh, really a, a great thing. Uh, I wanna make a correction or a, an amendment to something I said, the rank insignia on the sleeve of two uniforms uh, is not chief petty officer, it is petty officer first class, which is approximately equivalent to sergeant rank in the army or the Marines or the Air Force. So, I confirmed with a, a friend of mine who was in the Navy, uh, so I was close. Chief would have a, a rocker strap at the top of the chevrons. Chief Petty Officer would be essentially a, a command rank uh, for a listed man. So anyway, just want to correct that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, first of all, the question was asked, why did the Navy decide to name the Ashland the Ashland and the Henry Clay, the Henry Clay. Well, when the, the LSD class ship uh, were announced for World War One, that line of ships came into creation. They decided to name that line of ships after famous historic sites, places like Mount Vernon and Montpelier, et cetera. And so for whatever reason, they decided to start with Ashland, which I think is really neat. Henry Clay could be deeply honored that they did that. So, that started a whole group of these vessels named for historic sites. And as I noted earlier, when the second vessel was announced, or the announced they were making more, and the crew of the original vessel decided they wanted to see the name reused, so they petitioned the Navy for that. Now, when the Henry Clay was named, it was a part of a group of about 40 or 45 subs that were launched all at the, in a short period of time all named for American patriots, American or founding fathers, people like Patrick Henry and George Washington. So it's part of a series as well. And I, I want to say it was about the fourth of that series. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So we've been asked what happened to the LSD-1 and the SSBN-625 after decommissioning. When the LSD-1 was just decommissioned, it was sold into civilian service. And I think it ended up in Turkey and was used for a time in civilian service. And eventually uh, retired from service. And I believe it was scuttled at that point. The, the SSBN-625 was taken out of service the, the missile compartment was removed, uh, the missiles were removed, and the nuclear power plant was removed, and it was buried at a site for storing nuclear waste. The rest of that ship was scuttled as well, so it's also probably a reef at this point. The stern light, the glass part would hang down. So it would screw into a fixture and that would hang down from the fixture as far as I know.
the Dolphins on the house were something that James had made when he rebuilt Ashland in 1855-56. That style of dolphin is referred to as a Hawaldi And they are called that because if you look at heraldry, medieval heraldry, they are used in that. That is a heraldic dolphin. Um, and I suppose it was just an interesting stylistic choice. Uh, at that time, style of decoration involved sort of elaborate things of that nature. For example, we have a pair of office chairs in the collection that belong to Jane. They're leather seats and highly carved, and they have heraldic dolphins in the back. So, uh, they're pretty amazing. Uh, and, and I think it's a style of the time. Well, if there are no other questions, I uh, want to again thank Ken. He continues to evolve this process, and you can see the results we achieve get better every time. So we very much appreciate that. Also, want to remind everyone: all the artifacts you can see in our uh, in our website. Go to henryclay.org, click the Learn tab, drop down to the catalog. Uh, you can click the catalog in this folder for Wake Up with Ashland, or you can search our entire catalog for all of our artifacts. So take a look, enjoy, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.